Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we are continuing our Zen 4 review tour, this time with the Ryzen 7 7700X. Now, from a gaming perspective, this is the model that I've been most interested to check out, as it's an 8-core, 16-thread CPU using a single CCD, which should mean when it comes to gaming, it's going to deliver the best performance. So I'll certainly be looking into that. But before we do, let's quickly go over the specs. Much of this information has already been covered in our Zen 4 announcement video, but for those of you not yet up to speed, here's the rundown. The Ryzen 7 7700X is an 8-core, 16-thread processor that clocks between 4.7 and 5.4 GHz, depending on the workload. It's made up of a single 5 nanometer core complex die, or CCD, along with a 6 nanometer I.O. die, packs a 32 megabyte L3 cache, 6 megabytes of L2, DDR5 support, 28 PCIe 5.0 lanes, a 105 watt TDP, and is designed for the new AM5 socket, so there's a lot going on here. Now, quite surprisingly, whereas its predecessor, the 5800X, featured a launch price, or MSRP, of $450 US, the 7700X has dropped to $400 US, so that's an 11% discount for what should be a much faster processor. Though, I should note that at present, the 5800X can be had for as little as $280, so technically the Zen 4 8 core model is coming in at a massive 43% premium. So given that, it will want to be rather snappy. A closer matchup in terms of pricing would be the 5800X 3D, which currently costs $430, so slightly more than the 7700X, and that's going to make for a very interesting matchup. There's really a lot more to go over, but we'll talk about many of the new features and changes as we work through the review. So let's go over the test system specs, and then we'll get on with it. I've been busy for the past few weeks updating all of our CPU data, and as a result, we have 17 CPUs for comparison. For the AM4 platform, I've got a range of Zen 2 and Zen 3 CPUs with popular models such as the Ryzen 5 3600, Ryzen 7 3700X, and of course, the Ryzen 5 5600X. But there are a half a dozen more models also included. Then I've got the Intel 10th Gen Core series, with popular models from the Core i5, i7, and i9 ranges, and due to time I will be skipping the 11th gen series because that was a bit of a flop in our opinion. Then for the 12th gen core series of processors, I've tested using DDR4 3200 dual rank CL14 memory, and DDR5 6400 single rank CL32 memory, and we have from the Core i3 12100 up to the Core i9 12900K. The new AM5 test system is based on the MSI Meg X670E Ace, and AMD has insisted all reviewers use the supplied DDR5 6000 CL30 memory, so that's what we've done. Finally, please note all testing was conducted using the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti, Windows 11, and Resubsible Bar was enabled for all configurations. Okay, let's get into it. Just quickly before we dive into the blue bar graphs, here's a look at clock behavior in Cinebench R23. After an hour of load testing, the 7700X maintained an all core frequency of 5.1 GHz. Now this frequency was sustained using the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2 FX 360mm liquid cooler installed inside the Be Quiet Silent Base 802. Then for single core workloads, the 7700X appeared to maintain a clock frequency of 5.55 GHz, so 150 MHz above the advertised clock frequency. First up we have the Cinebench R23 results, and here we find the 7700X roughly matched the previous generation's 12 core part, the 5900X coming in just 3% slower. This did though make it 13% slower than the 12700K, which can be had for roughly the same price, suggesting that productivity benchmarks might not be all that smooth sailing for the new 8-core Zen 4 processor. Single core performance on the other hand is slightly greater than that of the 12700K, though only ever so slightly, but in terms of single core performance that does make the 7700X one of the best CPUs on the market right now. The 7-zip file manager compression performance is amazing, and this has been the case with all Zen 4 processors that we've looked at so far. Here it can be seen beating the 16-core 3950X while coming in behind the previous generation 16-core 5950X by a mere 7% margin. Half the cores, yet just 7% slower. That's a pretty amazing result. All of that said, it was 8% slower than the 12700K, so despite offering a huge leap forward from the previous generation, it's still a little bit disappointing compared to Elder Lake given the price. Though it is worth noting that AMD's SMT is far more powerful for decompression work, and as a result the 7700X crushes the 12700K here, offering almost 20% greater performance, basically matching the Core i9-12900K. 
The Blender Open Data results placed the 7700X alongside the 3900X and 12700K, so a great result here as it was also just 10% slower than the 12 core 5900X. Therefore, when compared to its predecessor, the 5800X, the 7700X was an impressive 27% faster. The Corona benchmark results were also impressive as here the 7700X nudged ahead of the 3900X, 10900K, and even beat the 5800X by a 21% margin. Disappointingly, however, it was 7% slower than the 12700K, Certainly not a massive margin, but given they both cost $400 US, you'd hope AMD could have beaten what is essentially a one-year-old competitor at this point. We've seen the 7950X dominate the Premiere Pro benchmark previously, and here we can see that the 7700X is just as impressive, beating the 5950X by a 10% margin and crushing the 12700K by an almost 40% margin. The Photoshop results are also highly impressive. Here the 7700X was 19% faster than the 12700K and 28% faster than the 5800X. This made it the fastest CPU we've ever tested as it managed to beat even the 7950X. The 7700X also performed well in After Effects, though it wasn't quite as dominant. Still, it did nudge ahead of the 12700K, albeit by a mere 3% margin, but that's better than some of the productivity results we've seen. This also meant it was much faster than the 5800X, offering a little over 30% greater performance. The last productivity benchmark we're going to look at is code compilation performance, and here the 7700X again does well, basically matching the 12700K, depending on the memory configuration used by the Alder Lake CPU. An impressive result overall, given that it was 8% faster than the 5900X, and a massive 50% faster than the 5800X. Now, time for the gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Factorio, which is very cache sensitive and really only looks at single core performance. The 7700X slots in right between the 7600X and 7950X, making it one of the fastest CPUs we've tested in Factorio, at around 6% faster than the 12700K. So a solid result overall, despite getting crushed by the 5800X 3D by a whopping 45% margin. It's really going to take the 3D vCache versions of these Zen 4 processors to top the 5800X 3D in this title. Moving on to Watch Dogs Legion, here the 7700X was mighty impressive, jumping ahead of the 7600X by a 10% margin and even edged out the 7950X. This placed it roughly on par with the 12900K using DDR5 memory and a massive 30% ahead of the 5800X. It's rare and almost unheard of to see a single CPU generation boost gaming performance by this much, especially given Zen 3 was certainly no slouch. Next we have Rainbow Six Extraction, and like the previously tested Zen 4 CPUs, the 7700X, it's not amazing here. That said, while this more middle of the pack type result looks quite poor, it is well worth noting that the 7700X was just 3% slower than the fastest CPU tested, the 12900K using DDR5 memory, so overall, certainly not a bad result. The 7950X and the 7600X results were already very impressive in Hitman 3, and with the 7700X we're getting more of the same, as it nudged ahead by just a few frames. This did however mean that the 7700X was 7% faster than the 12700K using DDR5 memory, not a massive win, but it was impressive to see the Zen 4 CPU coming out on top. Now, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands has been included, not because it's a super CPU demanding game, but rather because it's a good representation of how CPU demanding many modern games are. And that is to say, when using a relatively modern CPU, most games are going to end up being GPU bound, even when using an RTX 3080 Ti at 1080p, as we see in this example. The game can be useful for testing lower end CPUs, but for the 7700X it just shows that we're able to max out the RTX 3090 Ti here, matching other high end CPUs. Moving on to F122, which has already proven to be a strong title for Zen 4, we see that the 7700X pushes further ahead, hitting 343 FPS on average, making it 18% faster than the 12700K, and an impressive 7% faster than the 5800X 3D. We're also looking at a massive 28% performance uplift from the 5800X, so another near 30% generational leap for gaming from AMD. Next we have Spider-Man Remastered, and overall the results here are good, despite the fact that the 7700X does trail the 12700K by a 5% margin. So a bit disappointing in that regard, but when compared to the previous Ryzen processors, it's mighty impressive, offering 26% more performance than the 5800X. It does appear as though we've reached the limits of the RTX 3090 Ti and shut off the Tomb Raider at 1080p using the highest quality preset, 
as now even the 1% lows are no longer improving, at least beyond a frame here and there. Compared to the 12700K, we're looking at a similar average frame rate with a mere 2% boost to the 1% lows. The Zen 4 CPUs have all been impressive in Horizon Zero Dawn, and while the 7700X takes out the top spot here, it was just 1% faster than the 7600X. The gain over the 5800X wasn't that big either, though 12% is certainly nothing to scoff at, but the 20% gain over the 12700K was far more impressive. When compared to the 7600X, the 1% lows of the 7700X are much better in Cyberpunk 2077, and yet despite that it's still much slower than competing Elder Lake parts, such as the 12700K, trailing by a reasonably significant 10% margin with 153 FPS on average, opposed to 170 FPS. Now we've seen previously that the 5800X 3D is a beast in ACC, crushing everything, and Zen 4 hasn't changed that, at least these non-3D vCache models. The 7700X trailed the 5800X 3D by a 12% margin, though despite that it was still 14% faster than the 12700K, so a good result overall. Typically speaking, the Rift Breaker just, it's not a good title for Ryzen processors, and we saw previously that the 7600X and 7950X weren't really able to change that, and in fact, there appeared to be a bug with the dual CCD 7950X, which AMD says the developer is looking into. Hopefully they can solve it, as the 7950X should be able to match the 7700X, and that would make it one of the fastest CPUs in this title. The 7700X didn't exactly crush the competition here, but even so, pulling ahead of the 12700K by a 4% margin is a very solid result, given how uncompetitive Zen 3 is in this title. The last game we're going to look at is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and damn, the 7700X is fast here, taking out top spot, beating even the 7950X. We're looking at an impressive 543 FPS, making it a massive 29% faster than the 12700K, and almost 50% faster than the 5800X, so that is a stellar result, to say the least. Now, onto the 12 game average, and as expected, the Ryzen 7 7700X has come out strong, taking top spot in our testing, narrowly beating the 12900K using DDR5 memory by a 2% margin. Then, when compared to the similarly priced 12700K, it was 6% faster and a massive 21% faster than the CPU it's replacing, the 5800X. It's really quite incredible to see that all three Zen 4 CPUs tested so far are faster than the 5800X 3D, and that's not something I was expecting to find going into this testing. Now here's a quick look at power consumption for an all-core workload. The 7700X pushed total system usage slightly higher than that of the 5900X, but did manage to come in under the 12700K, so not amazing given that it was slower than both processors, but the margins here aren't huge. Still, the 7700X is no better than either CPU in terms of performance per watt, at least for all-core workloads, like what we're seeing here with Blender. Now, as explained previously, but I'll explain it again for those of you who might have skipped to the 7600X and 7950X reviews, when it comes to cooling, the Zen 4 CPUs intentionally give the impression that they're difficult to cool by delivering as much performance as possible by taking full advantage of the thermal and power headroom. AMD says with the new AM5 socket and higher TDP, Zen 4 processors will run into a thermal wall before they hit a power wall. This means under heavy load, they'll sit at TJ Maxx, which is about 95 degrees Celsius, and this will be particularly true for the 12 and 16 core models. AMD stress that this behavior is intended and by design, and say it's important to note TJ Maxx is the maximum safe operating temperature, but not the absolute maximum temperature. In the case of Zen 4, the processors are designed to run at TJ Maxx 24 7 without risk of damage or deterioration. AMD also went on to stress that 95 degrees is not running hot, rather Zen 4 will intentionally go to this temperature as much as possible under load because the power management system knows that this is the ideal way to squeeze the most performance out of the chip without damaging it. The good news being that almost all AM4 coolers will be compatible with AM5, the only exceptions here being those that are secured from the rear side of the motherboard as the backplate for AM5 is non-removable. This means that all coolers can now be installed without requiring root access to the motherboard, and this is the case with HDDT processors, so that is excellent news. Now, for testing, we're using the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2 FX 360mm liquid cooler, which is 100% compatible with AM5. After an hour of looping the Cinebench R23 multi core test with the Pure Loop 2 FX installed inside the Be Quiet Silent Base 802, we recorded a peak CPU temperature of 97 degrees, so just above the 95 degree TJ Maxx that AMD says the CPU targets for maximum performance. 
It'll be interesting to revisit these Zen 4 processors using a range of coolers to see how cooling performance affects CPU performance, and this is something I will look into in the not too distant future. Now let's do our value analysis, starting with the cost per frame of just the CPU. The 7700X was on average just 5% faster than the 7600X, but cost 33% more, which makes sense as you're getting 33% more cores. For gaming though, that much CPU power isn't required and probably won't be for quite some time, so the 7700X comes in at a 27% price premium per frame. Still, when compared to the competing Intel parts, such as the 12700K and 12900K, the 7700X is better value when just looking at the CPU cost. Taking a look at cost per frame while also including the memory and motherboard costs, which for the DDR4 configurations includes a 32GB kit of DDR4 3200CL14 memory at a cost of $200 US. Then for the DDR5 configurations, $280 US is what you can expect to pay for DDR5 6000 or 6400 memory. And for the motherboards, the AM5 models are based on the $290 MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi and AM4 uses the ASUS Tough Gaming X570 Plus Wi-Fi, which costs $180. And then we have the MSI Pro Z690 P DDR4 at $180, and the MSI Pro Z690 A DDR5 at $210. Based on those prices, the 7700X isn't amazing value, but for flagship tier performance, it still beats out the 12900K while offering similar value to that of the 12700K. It's also now just 6% more costly per frame than the 7600X, making it an attractive option for those seeking the ultimate performance. Like the 7600X, the 7700X is pretty weak in terms of value when it comes to core heavy productivity, both delivering worse value than even the Core i9-12900K. The much more expensive 7950X is worlds better here, so if productivity is the priority, then you can ignore the 6 and 8 core Zen 4 options. Now for mixed workloads that rely on strong single core and multi-core performance, the 7700X does fare much better, and in fact takes out top spot for value in the Premiere Pro benchmark. So when it comes to productivity, it will depend on the application, though having said that the 7950X was still faster overall, so if time is money, then that is obviously the way you'd go. The Ryzen 7 7700X looks to be the new king of gaming, taking out the Core i9 1200K in our 12 game sample, but of course, I'm keen to compare them head to head across more than, let's say, 30 games. And that's something I do plan to do soon, though I will wait for the next gen GPUs before sinking about a week or so into that testing. When compared to existing Intel Elder Lake CPUs for gaming, the 7700X appears to be the superior option from a performance standpoint, while offering a similar level of value to that of the 12700K, and much better value than the 12900K. That said, if you're prioritizing core heavy productivity, then the choice between the Elder Lake i7, i9, and then of course the Ryzen 7 7700X, it's a lot less obvious, but really it doesn't matter as you just opt for the 7950X or perhaps the 7900X, which we'll be looking at next. Perhaps a more difficult decision for prospective buyers is the choice between the 7600X and 7700X. Right now, the 7600X is clearly better value, even when factoring in the entire platform costs, Though, if you're going to build an entire PC from the ground up, the 8-core model will at most only cost you a few percent more, so at that point you might as well part with the $100. On average, the 7700X was just 3% faster for gaming, though we did see instances where it was up to 11% faster, but of course it does cost 33% more, or just 11% more if you throw in the costs of the motherboard and memory, which is why the cost per frame was quite similar for that comparison. Realistically though, the 7600X is still going to be the better value option overall, as performance is generally very similar, and this will almost certainly hold true for years to come, just as we've seen with past releases. I'd say you guys remember when 8-core CPUs were all the rave for gaming, but if we look at our 12-game sample, which is largely based on modern titles, the Ryzen 7 3700X was on average just 4% faster than the 3600, so despite those CPUs being significantly slower than these new Zen 4 models, core scaling is remarkably similar. Likewise, the 3950X is just 4% faster than the 3700X, so it's almost guaranteed that within the realistic lifespan of these processors, the 7950X won't overtake the 7700X for gaming, say within the next 5-8 to eight years. So purely for those of you gaming, there's really no need to invest in the 7900X or 7950X. Keeping all of that in mind, the Ryzen 7 7700X is actually my Zen 4 recommendation for gamers, 
At present, AM5 is an expensive platform, and if you're faced with having to spend well over $200 US on DDR5 memory, and the same for an entry-level X670 motherboard, then there's a little point saving $100 on the 6-core CPU. At that point, you might as well go the full hog and ensure maximum gaming performance. Now, this recommendation could change with the arrival of sub $200 B650 boards, and I've already got a few of those on hand, but aren't allowed to show them off yet. DDR5 pricing will almost certainly continue to fall, so in a few months, the 7600X should make sense as a sort of AM5 value option, if you will. But for now, I'd overlook it for the 7700X. Of course, it may pay in more ways than one to just hold off for at least a month or two, not just for cheaper DDR5 memory, but also to see what Intel brings to the table with Raptor Lake, their 13th Gen Core series. Though it will want to be exceptionally good to overthrow the 7700X, given that the 13th Gen is arriving on what is effectively a dead platform with no support for future CPUs. And on that note, a strong argument for spending big on a quality AM5 motherboard now is the fact that you'll still be able to use it in 2025 for a CPU upgrade and then have the option of slotting in, say, a Zen 6 CPU for what should be a massive upgrade. With Intel, on the other hand, you will require a new motherboard in three years and potentially memory should you opt for DDR4 now. Anyway, there is really plenty more to explore with these new Zen 4 CPUs, but for now, I'm very impressed with what I've seen and I can't wait to jump into some of those big benchmark sessions. And with that, I'm going to end the video here. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff. 7900X review coming tomorrow. And then we have plenty more content following that. And of course, some big benchmarks in the not too distant future. Uh, if you'd like to become a Hardware Box community member, we have Floatplane, Patreon. Those things are pretty cool. You get ex uh, access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, behind the scenes content, and Q&As. So a lot of cool stuff there worth checking out. But if you're not interested, that is, of course, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.